Welcome to my talk, which was scheduled to take place at the meeting of the German Physical Society in Bonn that was cancelled for coronavirus. Well, quantum gravity seems to be an ambitious uh, thing to talk about because if you ask any physicist what's the biggest problem of physics, he would answer, well, to unify relativity and quantum theory, the two most important theories, the two columns of theoretical physics. So it seems very ambitious, but it seems that a lot has been achieved because if you do a Google search about books on quantum gravity, you obtain impressive results. It's tempting to assume that if so many people write about quantum gravity, they must know what they're writing about. No, I don't think so. Because there are many so-called candidate theories of quantum gravity, some of which, like string theory, I believe they are not even science. But, uh, well, I don't think that most of these uh, theories are promising and uh, I hate to say it, most of this is crap and I tell you why. Because science is about evidence and that means testability. And testability means you have an observation and you've got to explain that quantitatively. That means you have to come up with a number and uh, calculate the number which is observed. And this was precisely the way Dirac did physics. Uh, it's, success in physics is not when somebody throws a pile of money at you, it's when you have found out something. So I have made up the, a modern version, but uh, this truly happened. Um, as the legend goes, when physicists uh, came along and met Dirac, they said, Oh, Mr. Dirac, we have a new theory. He interrupted rudely and said, uh, Wait a second, uh, can you calculate the fine structure constant? No? Well, come back when you have done it. Because the fine structure constant is one of the big riddles of physics, the unsolved problems, because it's a number, a pure number, which you can measure, but you cannot derive theoretically. And this is a similar problem in um, quantum gravity, too. Because look at the hydrogen atom. Okay, uh, The entire quantum theory is contained in there. It's the most elementary system in microscopic physics. And of course, you should have also a gravitational force um, that pulls the electron and the proton together. And there is an electric force related to gravity, and if you take the ratio, you arrive at an incredibly huge number, 2.3 uh, to the 10 to the 39, a number with almost 40 digits, and uh, that's an incredible puzzle. And Dirac was really, he was, he was devastated, he was, he was, he just couldn't make up his mind how any reasonable mathematics should produce such a huge number. Because his idea was a theoretical physicist has to predict numbers. Okay. So, uh, I think this is the correct approach, maybe an unusual way to phrase it, but th this is the correct approach to tackle the quantum gravity riddle. And as a physicist, if you come up uh, with a th new theory of quantum gravity, Either you predict this number, or you, or you better shut up. It's as simple as this. So, uh, in Dirac, of course, he has had also a very, very interesting idea, and I think it's the only reasonable idea because it's quantitative. And it's called large number hypothesis. Hypothesis. Um, you know, you have this incredibly huge number and you have uh, the microscopic world and when in the early 1930s cosmology was uh, the first results of cosmology came up Dirac was the first to realize okay if we take the if we take the biggest structure in the universe 
with the size of the universe, and the smallest structure in the universe, the size of the proton, there is also a ratio of 10 to the 40s. Okay? This is almost the same number if you talk about orders of magnitude, and it's an incredibly puzzling observation that these numbers more or less coincide. So you might be skeptical and say, okay, this is just one thing, but there is another incredible coincidence. We're talking about the number of particles in the universe. When the first mass estimates in the universe were done, you can calculate the approximate number of particles in the universe divided by the proton mass and you end up with a number with uh, 78 digits the square of this mysterious number 10 to the 39 we have met before so this is really mysterious and it's uh, well Dirac commented this is a remarkable coincidence there is nothing to add and uh, well modern so-called modern physics often disregards this um, this uh, large number hypothesis of Dirac's as speculation or even numero numerology but I tell you one thing numerology is something successful in physics okay Johann Jakob Balmer in 1885 he discovered the, the, the basics of atomic physics by doing numerology and Maxwell's theory is based on that observation of, of the uh, speed of light and the electric and the magnetic constants this was found by doing numerology so maybe after all it's not such a stupid method to do physics and one consequence of uh, Dirac's uh, large number hypothesis if you go back if you put these two observations together there is another very interesting coincidence which goes back as idea to Ernst Mach in 1883. So he had the very, very um, intriguing idea of relating the strength of gravity to the uh, masses of the universe. The problem was uh, nobody knew about the size and the mass of the universe back then because cosmology wasn't even born as a science. Okay? So uh, we have the, the unfortunate situation that um, uh, Mach couldn't really quantitatively develop his idea but there is a very interesting coincidence uh, the gravitational constant is related to the square of the speed of light and the radius and the mass of the universe okay people would call it in another, in another way but it's very very remarkable and of course it fits to Dirac's hypothesis so what I'm going to, this is all known what I'm going to talk to about uh, today is, I mean, I admit that Dirac's hypothesis seems a very fancy thing. I mean, how on earth should that be related, okay? The strength of two interactions and the size of the universe. So, and, and also the second hypothesis about, about the number of particles, I mean, it's very, very hard to reconcile it with, with uh, cosmology, a bit conventional cosmology. So, uh, there is, I think, a very interesting way of rewriting the, uh, this observation of Dirac. So, we start by just writing down the numbers, the uh, electric force and the, the r squared cancels, and so we have the ratio of the electric and the gravitational force here and uh, well we may put in the fine structure constant which is e squared divided by 2 hc epsilon 0 which is approximately the number um, inverse number 137 and of course you have the mass ratio of proton and electron so we may just rewrite this number and uh, if we talking if we talk about orders of magnitude this ratio more or less equals hc divided by g is a gravitational constant and the mass of the proton squared. Now, if we go ahead uh, and uh, start from hc divided by g m p squared, we put these other two 
relations uh, in, which is uh, Mach's principle, the observation, and Dirac's second hypothesis. So, uh, after two very simple steps, we end up with the radius of the universe and, um, times uh, Planck's constant divided by C, radius of the proton squared mass of the proton, and this still, as the hypothesis goes, should be equal to the radius of the universe divided by the radius of the proton. Okay, if this is true, which means um, Dirac's hypothesis, so then the very simple uh, relation H equals CMPRP must hold a very, very simple coincidence of Planck's constant to look at it at it as a product of, of the speed of light and the mass of, and the radius of the proton. Actually, this was found by another physicist in 1947, was observed by someone else. And, uh, well, so nobody cared very much about this hypothesis, and uh, but there is another uh, recent development which should, um, yeah, make us uh, maybe take that hypothesis even more seriously because the proton radius, radius puzzle is um, 10 years ago uh, a, a new measurement of, of the proton radius was done and the result was stunningly different from um, almost 5% different uh, from the previous value of um, 0.87 femtometers and uh, as a sideline you might wonder why all the particle physics business at CERN they haven't realized that e earlier but anyway uh, it's now almost established that the proton radius is 0.84 femtometers and uh, if you think about coincidences and you, if you're wondering about numerical correlations you might just uh, think about as adding a simple factor to that above formula of pi divided by 2 and you end up with a stunning coincidence of um, uh, which is inside inside the measuring value okay so h equals t pi divided by 2 c mass of the proton radius of the proton and uh, well, coincidence or not, uh, I mean, this is not a proof, but uh, it's, it's not something very outlandish as a physical formula. And I want to, to point out another interesting relation. De Broglie, in his 1929 uh, doctoral thesis, he came up also with the coincidence H equals C and P R P. No, sorry, he came up with the, with the formula below. But it's very easily related. If you think about, let's say, what what could be an elementary particle B, think about a circulating light wave or something, and if you just put in uh, C, the speed of light, equals um, 2 pi, the frequency and the radius, that would be very natural if, if you assume that, and if you put this into the other formula, you end up with H a very well-known quantity, the energy of, of light quanta, would be one-fourth of the rest energy of that stuff. Now, I mean, and actually de Broglie speculated about he, he put together HF and MPC squared without the factor, but I think we're in a very interesting environment here, and I think this is a, very, a much more intuitive way of looking at the same thing. It makes you think about explaining elementary particles, maybe with models of light or something. And, uh, well, it's also related to another interesting piece uh, in, his, uh, in his 1938 paper about this uh, hypothesis. Dirac speculated about a variable speed of light. He was actually not, not uh, speed of light, but at a variable expansion rate. And this was very close, very close to a uh, speed of light approach. 
uh, of um, describing general relativity. I think this is particularly interesting in this context because as variable speed of light theory was considered by Einstein in 1911, I cannot go to, into the details here, but um, in 1911 Einstein, uh, actually th this was his, his first idea about formulating general relativity starting from a variable speed of light and explaining uh, by using that variability to uh, to explain the light deflection and it's it's somehow uh, tragic that Einstein and Dirac they never talked about their best ideas which I think Einstein's best idea I think is the variable speed of light formulation of general relativity and Dirac's observation cosmological observation of these large numbers I think it's one of the most important contributions to physics well, to conclude, it's not only these two guys, but also Ernst Mach, I mentioned, but I did not mention uh, Dennis Schammer, Erwin Schrödinger, and Robert Dicke in particular, who also contributed to, um, to uh, this idea of variable speed of light that very well fits into Dirac's hypothesis. So I just uh, well wanted to to draw your attention to this um, aspect of quantum gravity but there is another uh, whole story behind and uh, I maybe you're interested to follow and uh, I show you some publications the first thing is a look at, at the abandoned contributions to cosmology of Dirac, Schama and Dickey published in Anna in 2009 and uh, some of this um, story ex is explained in my book Bankrupting Physics, which is a translation of my German book that got the Science Book of the Year award in 2010. And this is another book about the uh, status of particle physics. And Einstein lost key tries to uh, reassume all this uh, story of the variable speed of light, also with these aspects of Dirac's large number hypothesis and my last book the mathematical reality well also um, talks about this important equation of H and this uh, coincidence and tries to put it in a still more general context thank you for your attention